Hello friend, I'm so glad you could be here with us today. We are talking about anxiety and bulimia and how mindfulness can help. I think anyone with an eating disorder will hugely benefit from practicing meditation and mindfulness. If you're new to the show, my name is William Renner and this is the Meditation Daily Podcast. It's difficult, I think, for people to understand why on earth you would do that, but it's your way of being able to control behaviors, feelings, emotions in your life. On today's episode, I spoke with Kate Hudson Hall, a psychotherapist, podcaster, and author of the new book, Anxiety Hacks, Proven Techniques, Tools, and Tips to Calmness. They've done so much research since the early 2000s on how beneficial mindfulness is. Kate, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, William, thank you. I'm very excited to be here. And thank you for setting up this podcast. It's it's excellent. So on your journey to being a psychotherapist, um, I understand that you were suffering with bulimia. And how did that influence your, uh, your path towards being a psychotherapist? Yeah, that's a very good question. Oh, dear. So I, I it started off, I suppose it really started off from an experience I had when I was nine, when I was sexually abused. Um, and then I never spoke to anybody about that. Um, and then when I was 17, somebody, I suppose my, my body was changing and I was a late developer and my body had changed slightly, but I felt, oh my gosh, you know, I think I was a bit, in a bit of a panic about that. Um, and then somebody gave this suggestion to me, um, and they said to me, "Did you know if you make if you eat a Mars bar and make yourself sick, then you won't put the weight on?" And that was kind of the um, the catalyst, if you like. And my mind kind of took that and ran with it because I remember it so clearly, and it was such a long time ago. Um, and from then on. Because of my concern about my weight, even though I didn't have an issue as such, I um, I developed, you know, I tried different diets and then I gradually kind of morphed into bulimia. And then I had it very badly, very severely for 15 years. Um, and I had no idea what was going on with me. And I remember a friend of mine, she said to me at the time, she said, so when all of us girls are sitting around chatting, she said, why are you the only one that never actually talks about how you feel? And I had no idea what she was talking about because I was so detached from my feelings. Um, and, and I think that just kind of really explains how 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 confused my mind was. I had no idea what was going on. I thought I was just going mad. And I, you know, I had no way of of getting any help as such because it was a very long time ago. It was in the 1800s. I know I don't look it, but it was in the 1800s. <laughs> um, and um, there was hardly any books out on eating disorders, but particularly bulimia. And, you know, there was um, obviously no internet and there was no way to access any help. And even when my mother eventually, <clears throat> she tried many times to approach me about this problem because it was obvious that, you know, what I was doing, um, I was in total denial, you know, for a long time. And then finally... I allowed her, even though I wasn't really ready, but I allowed her to take me to the doctor. And the doctor, even then, he didn't, you know, he said, well, you know, why do you make yourself sick? And I thought, well, if I knew the answer to that, then I would change and not do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, then I, then from then on, then I was sent to a counsellor who I don't think was very helpful. And then I went to another one and, and it wasn't until I eventually found this one particular therapist who had also had an eating disorder. Um, and she, you know, she was like the, 
the the rock, if you like, the foundation for my recovery. And while I was seeing her, I, I didn't have a father. He died when I was two. So I was brought up by this loving mother. And when I was seeing this therapist, because I saw her for four plus years, and when I was seeing her, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. And then as a, a couple of years later, she died. And luckily, I was still with that therapist because I do believe now that if I wasn't, hadn't been seeing that therapist, I wouldn't be here today. That's, you know, it was just the most, it was losing a mother and a father in all at once. And it was the most traumatic time. Um, and I, I had done well with my patterns of eating by the time my mother died. And of course, you know, then I fell back into my old ways for a period of time with the bulimia. So, and then I eventually picked myself up with the help of this therapist and then got back on the, the sort of the straight path, if you like. But she was such a, a grounding foundation for me, for my recovery. So anyway, so then when I came out of the other side, you know, a number of years later, I thought, oh my gosh, I know what I want to do. I want to be able to help people how I've been helped. So that is why I trained then to, to become a therapist um, and to be able to help other people. And that was 22 years ago, so I've been doing it for a long time. And I, you know, have carried on and done lots of other trainings and I do lots of different therapies as well. So, yes, and then... Um, Four years ago, five years ago, I decided that I wanted to write a book. Um, and the book is called Bulimia Sucks. And it is 25% um, memoir of what my experience, what I went through with my eating disorder. And then um, the rest of it is self-help for people with bulimia. So it's lots of different ways to be able to, and, and different areas to help you along your recovery path. So, and then I also set up a podcast of the same name. Um, and so I have been working on that. Um, and it's for people who are going through an eating disorder. So not, not just bulimia, but going through an eating disorder and where, different ways that have helped them to be able to um, be able to help them move forward in their recovery path, and maybe books and different different avenues, therapies that they've tried. And then I also talk to professionals who work with people with eating disorders, um, and quite often they've been through an eating disorder themselves. So, yeah, so it's really interesting, really interesting. To, you know, to hear the different people's journeys. And we've had um, over 30,000 downloads now. So wow. hopefully we're helping lots of people. So I'm excited about that. Wow, you must be 30,000. Um, with, uh, with bulimia, what, what is the difference between bulimia and, and anorexia? Because I've heard both of those words kind of interchange sometimes, and I'm not really too clear on, on the difference. So and are those the only two eating disorders or are there other types of eating disorders as well? Oh, yeah, no, there's a number of different types. Um, but anorexia is, and bulimia are the ones that sort of the most um, heard about. Um, anorexia is when you deprive yourself of foods and you stop eating. Um, and, and then bulimia is um, when you... Um, you, you fall into this pattern of eating large amounts of food and then purging. Um, and it becomes your way of controlling your life in some way. It's your way of being able to cope with how you're feeling. It's, it's difficult because people that haven't had bulimia, it's difficult, I think, for people to understand why on earth you would do that. Um, but it's your way of being able to control your know, behaviours, feelings, emotions in your life. And it's, you know, they're both deeply deadly diseases. And then there's a combination. Some people can have, you know, a strain of one and a strain of both of the other. There's exercise bulimia 
um, which is people that over-exercise to compensate for the amount of food that they've eaten, but to really huge extremes. And then in 2013, um, the official the official title, or if you like, or whatever you like to call it, for binge eating, eating disorder, is, uh, is now very, um, a lot of people have that. So there's, there's a lot of different strains to it, and recovery is not a straight pathway. I and mean, it's finding the right help that, and finding what works for you finding, you know, a therapist, going to the doctor, if you have have got it, going to the doctor, going and finding a therapist that, that can really help you to start to work through these difficult behaviours. And is, is there an, uh, a certain demographic that's most affected by this? Is there a certain age that this tends to happen at? Um, or is it all throughout the life that this can um, happen? Well, f- for anorexia, it usually starts in sort of early teens for a lot of people. Um, but for somebody with bulimia, it's normally, although it does, you know, it is in younger kids as well, but it's the normal, the statistics show it normally starts from the age of eight, about 18, 18, 20. Um, but I have a lot of people that contact me that have had it for, you know, 25 years and they're trying to work through it. And they you know, they could be, Somebody I had last week was in their 60s and they've still got it and they've had it for so many years. And of course, it's such a secretive eating disorder um, that, you know, you get very good at hiding your behaviours. And then with lockdown for both, you know, for all the eating disorders would have been so traumatic for people, or was so traumatic for people. And then there's been a huge spike in in the statistics that show people with, you know, more people with eating disorders because of, well, for so many different reasons, depending on their situations, but they haven't got the access to food. You know, the, you know, the living conditions may come into it. You know, if they were at home the whole time with their family, they couldn't behave, you know, go down their normal behavior path around food. Um, and they didn't have the access to the food and, so many different reasons why it would have increased and then you know a lot of people that didn't have an eating disorder because of lockdown now have an eating disorder and people that were in recovery they you know they've sort of fallen back into their old patterns so Mm. there's a lot of statistics out there that show that you know during covid times it was was really um increased the amount of people that have an eating disorder do you have any um it's, I know it's this is a would be a difficult thing to, to to talk about in a in a short podcast but do you have any like advice or, or tips if, for people of how they can get started uh, on a path of recovery yeah um well like I said um it you know reaching out to your your doctor psychiatrist, or finding a good therapist um, is the first point of call, really. You know, and there's lots of charities out there that help people with eating disorders. So having a look online and, and seeing what you can find in, or even just joining those many, many different Facebook groups out there and just connecting with those and um, and hearing other people, what they're going through um, is also very helpful for people. But you've got to really, you know, want to do, want to gradually start to take that first step onto your recovery path. Um, and with the right therapist, you can do that. But also, you know, there's also the the difficulty for the the loved ones and the family and friends that know that their, you know, that their loved one has an eating disorder, and it's how they go about approaching them with it. Mm-hmm. And what they can do for them, um, you know. What I say to my my clients or the parents, the first thing that they need to do is to get online and find out as much information as they can before they go and speak to their 
their loved one um, find out everything they can um, and and you know as you approach them just allow them to open up and talk to you uh, and encourage them to talk about their feelings because particularly with bulimia it's not about the food it's about everything else around that's going on for them and um this podcast is centered around meditation and mindfulness is there uh is there a link between mindfulness and and bulimia or um or meditation do you know I think anyone with an eating disorder um, will hugely benefit from, from, from practicing meditation and mindfulness because it's going to give them a break from the eating disorder voice, which is constantly there driving their behavior. And so I, I know that it would definitely help them by learning those steps, but not just you know, they're in their everyday life, but physical changes in their brain will be seen if they were to start to practice, hmm. um, well, particularly mindfulness or, and meditation. But the sort of we were talking about it before, they're, all, they're both kind of intertwined, we believe. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, uh, the, so the, I practice the Anapana meditation, which is the awareness of the breath moving through the nose. And I find that... Um, there's like a really strong link between that and the, the thinking that especially the narrative mind. So when I'm aware of the breath passing through, through the nose, it has a tendency to kind of slow the narrative mind. So if there is with bulimia, if there's a, a, a thinking, a voice that's, you know, that, that keeps Constantly. talking to you. Yeah. Then uh, I think aw- like having awareness of the breath could really help with that. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I understand that now you're you're starting to focus on anxiety as well. I, I know that you've been uh, helping people with anxiety uh, throughout your career as well. But now you have a new a new book coming out about anxiety. Yeah, I have William. So it, my new book has just come out. Where well, it came out yesterday, um, and it's called Anxiety Hacks. Because, like you said, I I have over the years worked with so many people with anxiety. And, the, you know, as we move forward in life, it, anxiety just seems to be getting worse and worse for people. More and more people have anxiety. So I decided um, a couple of years ago that I wanted to write a book of how I help my clients with anxiety. Um, and so there are many, many different techniques and tools and tips in the book to be able to help people begin to break their, their difficult behaviours, the, bif- the dif- difficult anxiety behaviours. Um, and there's such a, a, a nice, good variety of different ways because we're all different. And I think it's really important that, you know, that you have, you know, you have a book with lots of different choices so you find out what works for you and what you can use to be able to calm yourself mm-hmm. um and because i teach mindfulness um I, there's a there's a set, whole section on that a whole chapter on that and different ways that you can you can use that to be able to help you to like you say to be able to work with those difficult thoughts and feelings that are connected to anxiety i'm wondering why why you think uh, anxiety is is on the rise is it because of technology or do you have any thoughts on why it's why it's on the rise i think yeah i think because of technology and i think that people are much more stressed now than they ever used to be and lives are so much busier because of the technology the social media and the pressures that are put on on people or that people put on themselves by constantly um looking on social media I think that that's a huge part, particularly for the young people. Um, and I, um, I think there's a lot of different reasons. But even before the pandemic, um, 
we found there was a huge we had a huge increase in people connecting want reaching out for help for anxiety and now since the pandemic it seems to be that most people well a huge majority of people have anxiety and um you're you're going to be launching a new podcast around this subject as well yes so um i'm just about to launch the podcast also called anxiety hacks um and i am talking to people who have anxiety and similar to the the bulimia sucks so what different ways that people um that so i've talked to people that uh, have um have anxiety and what works for them what helps them through their difficult behaviors and then i also talk to people and professionals that have anxiety or maybe don't have anxiety but help people with anxiety so there's there is going to be a lot of different help in my podcast for people with anxiety so i want to have a really different wide variety of people that i talk to um, that have had different experiences because my I obviously having an eating disorder it's sort of inter- anxiety is intertwined in that behavior mm-hmm. um but my anxiety started when I was 5 and I had separation anxiety from my mother when I had to go to school but at the time nobody knew that's what it was and I was just told to get on with it but now if you know if that would ha- were to happen so severely as I as I had um as I was then you know they hopefully they would have addressed it back then um and then that that continued on and on because i went away to boarding school and i remember crying every night because of having to leave my mother for the first 3 weeks and then i'd have like a week of oh i feel a bit better now and then I'd be like the fifth week i'd see my mother again so then it was like the whole cycle would start off again and that went on for years so from the age of 11 until i was probably like 14 until i finally managed to overcome that somewhat but that was you know really severe separation anxiety but then there was no help nobody knew what it was and i just had to deal with it in the best way that i could and i think that was also intertwined in with the the eating disorder and there was lots of different you know and of course with the sexual abuse i never talked to anybody about that I didn't tell anyone until I was in my 30s until I was having therapy and then I started to open up about that. Mm-hmm. Um and so you know all these feelings were going to come out some somehow some way and for me it was with developing an eating disorder and the anxiety. Hey guys, I hope you're finding this conversation helpful. If you're listening to this as an audio podcast, you can watch the full interview on YouTube and if you're watching on YouTube, we have audio podcasts for your commute. For me, I I never experienced uh I wouldn't say severe anxiety but there was always, you know, some social anxiety that was there and I think that for me uh sobriety was a was a huge help that happened maybe four four years ago now or something like this um before the pandemic I started once I discovered meditation I started um realizing the importance of keeping a clear mind and uh sobriety was was going to help with that. So for me I know that alcohol and I think for probably most people in society alcohol yeah. and drugs are ways of trying to cope with uh social anxiety. Um but for me I discovered that by stopping these things it radically reduced the anxiety, especially marijuana. Um I don't know if I that's one technique I would say is can be super helpful with this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and we you know, I think for a lot of people that have anxiety, they know that if they have been out drinking or taking drugs the next day their anxiety will be, you know, up in the ceiling because it will it just intensifies those difficult feelings. So, congratulations, William. Oh, That's thanks. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's uh yeah. it was it wasn't uh you know I never had a severe addiction to these things I don't think but they were they were weighing on me in ways that I didn't uh I didn't recognize well it was happening especially because it's so um social you know it's so normalized 
to be doing these things. So I think having that uh, distance from it is is kind of rare. And then, I don't know, having it, it's, uh, yeah, it's just much easier. Life is much easier without it. Mm, absolutely. And like you say, it was your way of coping in social situations or, or maybe other areas as well. Um, so it's it's understanding it's understanding that you know whatever the problem is it's your way of coping with it so it's it's you know getting the help to be able to you know figure out how you can move forward from it and for you with the meditation is just incredible do you have any other um any other hacks that you can share on on the show about uh how people can cope with anxiety yeah. Um, well, in the book, I teach um, the tapping therapy. I don't know if you're aware of that. So it's the emotion freedom technique. So it's just amazing. So it's using, um, it's tapping on a routine of points on your body while thinking about any negative feeling that you have and you can, or, or thought, difficult thought maybe, and you can reduce down that feeling. So and it's it's really interesting, and the, it's, it, what I teach is the emotional freedom technique. But there's lots of different types of tapping therapy now. But the in the eighties there was a chap called Rod, Roger Callahan, and he developed something called thought field therapy. And what he found was that if you tapped on a specific point on your body while thinking about a specific feeling then you can reduce down that feeling. Um, and so there's lots of different thoughts or feelings that you have on the body that are connected to lots of different feelings. So it's quite complicated thought field therapy to learn the whole big picture. So then there was a chap called Gary Craig, and he learned the thought field therapy in the 80s. And then in the 90s, he went on and developed the emotional freedom technique. And he found if you tapped on this routine of points while thinking about any negative feeling, you can reduce that down. Um, and it's just incredible. And what's really good is you don't even have to believe in it. But if you were to give it a go, you can. It can help you to, you know, to to work with those difficult feelings. And the specific point for anxiety to help people with anxiety is in the collarbone point. Mm. So where the collarbone comes down to a v here if you were to tap on that point hmm. while while thinking about your anxiety it'll help to reduce the anxiety so it's hmm. where the collarbone comes down to a v and you just tap on either side of that point and it can help to calm you and reduce your anxiety it's one of my favorite points super helpful <laughs> um but it's really really powerful the emotion freedom technique um and and like i said they've now developed over the years people have taken it and then sort of molded their own type of tapping therapy but that was kind of the original where it stemmed from but in my book i've got um the steps of how to do it um and then there is a companion course that goes with the book which is a link to videos of me showing you how to do each technique so you can go in there and actually see, um, see how you know, see me teaching you how to do it. Very, so very that's cool. That's really good. Really good. Um, another another way for you to try. Another something else for you to try. Um, and at the moment, the book. So the book has just come out, Anxiety Hacks, and it's it's available for ninety nine cents for the Kindle this week, and then next week it'll be free for a week so Beautiful. if you wanted a copy of it you just hop on there hop onto amazon <laughs> beautiful this reminds me the tapping technique reminds me of the vipassana meditation that i do which is an, another one so i do the mindfulness of breath but also vipassana which is a, a scanning of the body um, it's also called insight meditation so the idea is to um, kind of penetrate the structure of the of the mind and the body by observing the sensations and um, continuously scanning the body so that you're aware of all the sensations on the body but the the interesting thing about it is that the mind 
when when you do this, you see that the mind and the the body are so closely linked. Whenever there's a thought in the mind, there's also a sensation that's happening on the body. And that's just, you know, science. We know that, you know, if there's there's thoughts happening in the mind, there's sensations happening on the body. But by focusing on the sensation on the body, you're taking the focus away from the the thought in the mind. So you might be having a a really negative, angry thought. And at the same time, there's probably like maybe your chest is tight or there's, uh, you know, your breath might be faster. There's different things that are happening in the body. So by like shifting your awareness to the the feeling in the body, it kind of takes you out of the, the whatever negative thing is happening in the mind and it allows it to kind of dissipate. So I can see like how tapping yeah. would have that same kind of relation. Yeah. Who do you think we have approximately 60,000 different thoughts that go through our mind every day, which is crazy. You know, some are in the, you know, the unconscious and some are just constantly running through your mind, which is an enormous amount of thoughts. And what's really interesting is that 95% of those thoughts that we have every day, are the same thoughts that we had yesterday, unless we start to be aware of them and start to change them, they're the same thoughts. We're like, oh, well, oh. And then for, for people overall, in general, the, um, it's 75% of those thoughts that we have every day are not very positive thoughts, are negative thoughts, because that's how we've been created. So if you think, unless we start to gradually be aware of how we're talking to ourselves and what we're saying to ourselves and start to sort of take note and start to sort of push back and and change those thoughts, they're always going to be the same thoughts. It's no wonder we have so much anxiety with all these thoughts, that negative yeah. thoughts moving through the mind. And useless yeah. thoughts, thoughts that have no, that don't serve any purpose. If we had them yesterday, we don't need to have them again today. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and a lot of people aren't aware of the thoughts that they're having, you know, it's, it's taking a step back and thinking, oh my gosh, you know, and a lot of the time it's, you know, it could be you having an argument in your head about something mm -hmm. somebody said and the different scenarios and, um, and it's starting to, you know, to, to be aware of that. And for a lot of people, they listen to those thoughts and they actually believe what they tell themselves, which, you know, which is the, the point is that those thoughts you know, most of the thoughts we have are not true anyway. Those negative thoughts. But a lot of people believe them. Again, I got I have to speak to the the mindfulness of breath. For me, this is just such a powerful technique because it's training, you know, every day I'm training the mind to to it's having thoughts. The thoughts are gonna come, but then to train the awareness to come back to the, the feeling of the breath, the natural breath that's already happening. It's so I, like training, training ourselves because the thoughts are going to come. We need to be, I think we need a lot more training uh, to help redirect our awareness to, you know, the present moment. I, they should be doing that with, with children more. We should really be learning this as a fundamental skill, I think. Yeah, in the UK they did before COVID start to teach mindfulness in schools. Oh, good. But um, then they ran out of funding. Uh, so hopefully in the future they will, you know, they'll pick that up again because it's really important for everybody to be practicing it and starting to understand it and learn it. You know, because of the, you know, particularly with mindfulness, the, they've done so much research since the beginning you know, since the early 2000s on how beneficial mindfulness is, that they found all these huge changes in the brain. And one of them, I particularly, there's, there, are so, there is so much research that's been done in the same sort of way. And what they do is, the scientists and the researchers, they take a group of people and they, they do MRI scans on their brains beforehand, and then they teach them a mi an eight-week mindfulness course. So they're practicing mindfulness every day. And then they, they do an MRI scan on their brain afterwards, and they found all these physical changes in the brain, really powerful physical changes. For example, the amygdala, which is in charge of the anxious part of the brain, that fight or flight, that part of the brain had shrunk 
which is just incredible, incredible. And the prefrontal cortex, which is controls our decision making and our sort of everyday being, that part of the brain had become thicker. And then the connection between the two had shrunk as well. Mm. And there's been so much research done in that same way by so many different researchers and scientists that they, they, they find. And there's other changes as well that helps in memory and it helps you know, it helps so many different parts of, of the mind. That's wonderful. I hope, I hope that the policy starts to catch up. Absolutely. Um, and people, you know, the, particularly mindfulness, well, and meditation, the, the, you know, the mindfulness is more of a, an inward now, but the majority of people don't understand really what it is. But it is very easy and simple but also hugely powerful and beneficial. I think it's often overlooked because of how, or perhaps it has been in the past because of how simple it is, you know? If people think it can't be that simple. Yeah, yeah. and there's so many different areas and problems that it can help from, you know, helping to lower your blood pressure to people that have difficulty sleeping, I think everybody, all my clients I teach mindfulness to, they've all hugely benefited over the years from um, practicing mindfulness to help them to sleep. Um, and, you know, and it helps with pain um, and depression. Um, it's really good for, you know, for, like I said, eating disorders, but also for, you know, couples, maybe couples conflict so many huge benefits by practicing it um kate thank you so much for being on the show uh i've really appreciated it if people want to get a hold of you what's the best way to reach you um well to go to my website which it which is kate hudson hyphen hall h-a-l-l dot com or my email is kate hudson hall at gmail.com um, or come join me on facebook um, under Kate Hudson Hall, and then I'm, I'm all the, all my social media media handles is my name so at Kate Hudson Hall. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Thanks again. Thank you, William. Hey guys, I hope you found my conversation with Kate Hudson Hall to be helpful. Remember, if you're struggling with bulimia or anorexia, you're not alone. There are people that want to help, so I encourage you to reach out. And there will be links below to Kate's podcast where she has tons more resources for you.